Um, name is, my name is Portia. Um, today we're going to talk about the k-nearest neighbor algorithm and machine learning in general. This is a really good introduction if you're not quite sure about machine learning and what it involves and the practical uses. A little bit about me, I am the organizer of the Portland Data Science Group, and I'm very happy to see some members here in the audience. We actually um, have a presentation tomorrow about natural language processing, so if you're interested, yeah, check us out. I'm also founder of PLB Analytics, which specializes in data science. And if you indulge me during the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about that project. It's very interesting. Well, I think it's interesting. <laughs> so let's begin. So these are the things that we'll cover today. A uh, brief intro to what is machine learning. We'll go over the Python machine learning package called Scikit-learn. Um, we'll explain what is the k-nearest neighbor and how do you use it. Um, a demo of scikit-learn and KNN, and the next step. The next step is a combination of two things. We'll get into that later. Machine learning. Machine learning is basically an algorithm learning from the data that you're already giving it. You can also call this kind of like instant-based learning. So instead of you giving it a command, it takes the data that you already have and makes decisions. Um, the algorithm usually uses the data to create a predictive model, to classify unknown entities. That's something that we will focus on today. Among other things, discover patterns. The basic workflow of machine learning, 70% of your time is spent cleaning and standardizing the data. I actually think that's very conservative. Lately, I've been spending around 80% of my time chasing NANs and, <laughs> and chasing number integers that are really strings and standardizing. It, it takes a while. 20% um, of your time is pre-processing your data, training it, validating. And the 10% is what I consider the fun part, where you get to analyze. You get to figure out what the inside of your data is, or you get to visualize. Um, there are many ways of visualizing your data. You can use D3 JavaScript. I uh, use D3 JavaScript when I'm feeling fancy. I haven't been feeling fancy lately. So um, I use matplotlib. Matplotlib is um, excellent. And matplotlib is basically what you make of it. You can use an RC file, and you can make matplotlib plots look, I don't want to say professional, but look nice. Um, if anyone is in the R community, yes, ggplot? Yes. So um, ggplot, I feel like, is better than matplotlib. But you can make matplotlib plots look similar to ggplot. Let's continue. Um, Scikit-learn is Python's machine learning package. Scikit-learn is great. It has wonderful documentation. And it has built-in data sets. So if you are sticking your toe into what is machine learning, it's sometimes daunting to also find your own data. And um, Scikit-learn has some data sets that you can actually use to play around with before you start importing and finding your own data. Um, this is also part of the documentation. Let's say that you have a machine learning problem and you're not sure, OK, machine learning, it's on my lap. I need to come up with a solution, where to go. This is a bit of a roadmap of Scikit-learn algorithm cheat sheet. It's basically a good guide to show you or guide you which algorithms are useful, which problem you're trying to solve. Taking a step back, you can figure out what kind of problem do you have. Do you have a classification problem, a clustering problem? Is it a regression problem? Or do you have a dimensionality reduction issue? I mean, do you have too many features? Once you figure out or have a handle on what type of problem you have 
then you can take the next step and start experimenting with different classifiers and algorithms. Many companies use scikit-learn. Um, one company in particular is Evernote. Evernote, you, oh, I'm glad that you like the donut sandwich. <laughs> um, Evernote uses scikit-learn as a way to classify your notes. Um, are you familiar with Evernote? Yes, yes. Good. Evernote, let's say you are at a website and you want to make it into a note. Um, Evernote has a feature where you can choose the notebook you'd like to put that note into, or it gives you a suggestion. That suggestion, when it suggests the notebook, I'm glad someone's enthusiastic about this. It's a special, yeah, it's a special plugin. Yes. And even, yeah, Firefox as well. Um, this is a classification problem. And every time you assign a note to a notebook, you're actually in a process of training your uh, classifier. Um, it Im implements Naive Bayes classification algorithm, which is right over here if you're curious. Supervised learning and unsupervised learning are two very important concepts to keep in mind when you're um, learning or implementing machine learning. Unsupervised learning is when your data is not labeled. You're basically taking a bunch of information, dumping into the algorithm, and say, hey, figure it out. I want you to classify. I want you to distinguish the categories by yourself. I'm not part of this. Supervised learning is when you take your data and you actually label it. So you're not relying on the algorithm to do the labeling of your known quantities. You're labeling it yourself. So in individuals who are, domain, you call them domain masters, um, they tend to do the labeling. This is something that I did last year. Last year, I worked for a company um, called Trapit. And I helped with the labeling of Chinese articles. I knew Mandarin, so I was able to label it, OK, this article is a sports article. This article is a fashion article. So that's an example of supervised learning. And that's something that we're going to do today. Here's a theoretical data model for supervised learning. You have your predictors. You take your predictors, and you have your outcome. Remember to keep your sample size high, and you want to keep your feature set low. The reason why you want to keep your feature set low is that you want to avoid overfitting your model, and you also want to avoid putting unnecessary noise into your model. Like you want to make sure that your model is a representation of signal. Here's some examples of supervised learning besides Evernote. Handwriting analysis, and you can find this in documentation as well. Spam filters, and finally, KNN. KNN, K nearest neighbor algorithm, it's one of the simplest machine learning algorithms there. If you're learning machine learning, this is probably the first algorithm that you'll be introduced to. Um, it is considered a lazy algorithm, which means that it doesn't run computations on your data set until you introduce a new data point to it. It's not eager. Um, it's not eager. And our example will use KNN for supervised learning. Mystery fruit. You're probably not going to approach this problem, but here it is. Let's say that you have a piece of fruit that you're not sure what the identity is thus mystery fruit. What you're going to do in KNN, you're going to take the three closest neighbors. So you're going to take the fruit that is closest in feature to your mystery fruit. And you're going to add up which of these features, um, you're going to add up which of these fruits are closest to your mystery fruit. So we have three points, and we have our mystery fruit. 
So according to this demo, um, what do you think the mystery fruit is? Is it an orange or is it an apple? Apple. <laughs> the mystery fruit? Good question. The mystery fruit is the one with the question mark in the middle. So we're going to talk about that in the next slide. <laughs> That is true, and that's what we're going to get into in our live coding demo. We're going to talk about the different features and what we're taking into account. Yes, but if you're doing a simple county, it is an orange. Um, this is what you call the majority vote. There are two different ways that you can do a majority vote. Um, one is equal weight, which means each neighbor has equal weight, and then there's the distance weight. Distance weight meaning that each vote is based on the distance of the item, which is what has been already mentioned. Um, how KNN works, middle school math, it uses Pythagorean theorem. I find um, in my job in general, I use a lot of math that I thought I would never use and it was a waste of time. <laughs> the downside of KNN is that since there's a high minimum training, there's a high computational cost in testing new data. And the correlation is sometimes falsely high, data points can be given too much weight. Live demo time. Before we do our live demo, let's get into some um, background information. Our data set is typical. If you are machine learning 101, you probably approach the iris data set. Um, it's not only typical, it's quite old. It was, <laughs> it was created in 1936. It predates um, the machine learning that we know now. It predates Python. It, it was analyzed by Sir Ronald Fisher, and it was collected by Edgar Anderson. So our iris, the point of our, the point of this live demo is to figure out what type of iris we have. And we're going to figure out which type of iris we have by looking at the length and the width of the sepal and the petal. This is going to be um, what, our result, what our result will look like. The dots is the training data. And these three colors, which I would say pink, green, this is supposed to be glue, blue, it looks kind of grayish. This is going to be our test data. I think I can, oh. And here are the example data points for our iris species. This is a sepal length and width, and these are the different species. Okay. Oh, you can't see that. <laughs> Give me one moment. Huh. Ah, excellent. <laughs> Where is my mouse? Oh, wow, this is definitely slow going. I'm sorry. Finally. Excellent. Now, I can't see it. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah. OK. All right, I can't see it on my computer, but. The um, mirroring option. So mirroring. I Apple system preferences. So we'll go over here, system yeah. preferences, and I guess the mirror is not on. And show mirroring options. We should have a little Oh, arrangement. There OK. Mirror displays. Yeah, thank you. Here we go. Awesome. Cool. Sorry about that. Cool. Thank you. OK, excellent. Um, I'm using IPython Notebook. 
IPython notebook I use on a daily basis. It's um, great for you. It's great for you to uh, test your code and for you to do visualizations. Uh, main attraction. So these are the libraries I'm importing: NumPy, PyLab, Matplotlib, and Scikit-Learn. I am setting my neighbors to 37, so it's 37 of the closest neighbors. This is where I am loading my data set. My data set is actually coming from the scikit-learn package, which is the iris data set. Is there a rule of thumb for picking your end? Um, yes. What I'm going to tell you is not complicated. <laughs> the rule of thumb is try not to, well, don't pick an even number. Because when you pick an even number, <laughs> Oh, you know where I'm going with this. <laughs> if you pick an even number, then you can have a tie. And it's good to try to avoid that situation. Really that as well, yes. So we're going to um, print the shape of our data set. 150, we have 150 um, um, irises. And we have two features that we're looking at. We're going to create our color maps. And in this section of the code, we are picking our classifier, which is K nearest neighbor. We are fitting our data into the model. We are setting our X and Y axes here. And we're creating our color plot. In this case, we're going to have two um, plots. The first plot will show you uniform weight, and the second plot will show you the distance weight. And here it is. So this is distance, and this is uniform. Um, if you use uniform, and if you're K, is 149, you would actually see that this section will, your distance, excuse me, this section will be all red. So it's important for you to figure out if you're using uniform or distance. All right. And if you want to play around with end neighbors, these are the instructions. Um, you can get this on GitHub. And you can play around with it yourself. Also, it's getting back to the presentation. All right, sorry about that. What to learn? Um, when one says data science or machine learning, that is all encompassing and that covers a lot of different topics. So if you want to experiment this on, you want to experiment with uh, machine learning and data science, I'm going to give you some sites and show you like what I do when I want to learn and obtain new information. These are the IPython notebooks I stock. Uh, <laughs> These notebooks are great because not only do you get to see the sample code, but you get to play around with it. Um, a person who I personally like, who's my hero, and I will never try to slay her, is <laughs> Julie Evans. Julie Evans is great. Um, she might as well be two people. She gives presentations, and she writes great documentation. She produces wonderful notebooks, and she's very friendly. So if you follow her on Twitter, and you throw her a question, odds are that she'll answer it. So Julie Evans is a good person to look for. Um, what else do I do? If you want to practice, Kaggle is a good place to go. Kaggle has great documentation on scikit-learn and machine learning in general. Kaggle is a machine learning competition. There are many different competitions. You can compete for money. You can compete for jobs. Or you can just play with the data set. Like, uh, there are many universities 
that use Kaggle, they put their data set there, and they have their students and other people play around with it. Um, let's see. And the link that you're looking at, if you're not sure exactly how to get started with Kaggle, um, in PyCon 2014, there's an excellent tutorial on using Kaggle to learn machine learning in general. It's about two hours long. It's one of the best ways that you can spend your two hours if you want to get started. It's a great presentation. And that's about it. What I can do next is I can tell you a little bit about what I do. Personally, I have, my, I have my own company. I've been in business for about five months, so it's a relatively new company. At this point, I don't use Scikit-Learn that often. I mostly use Pandas. But um, I just want to talk a bit about what does it mean to work as a quote-unquote data science. I don't like using the word data science because I feel like um, some of the stuff that I do is not as stringent as academic research. Some of the clients that I deal with, I help them create algorithms, uh, pricing algorithms. I also dig deep into their Excel files <laughs> and try to um, make sense of all the social media data that they have been collecting. That's on uh, my current project. Um, how do you live? <laughs> We've had this conversation several times during this conference. How do you start a business? In terms of data science, a lot of my, a big part of my job is actually educating people on what I do. I can't just show them a D3 chart that is animated and say, look, I can visualize my GitHub repo and have them say, OK, I want to give you my money. <laughs> I think the best part about my job is um, talking to people who are not in the industry and telling them and showing them how what I do can bring value to their business and value to their lives, which I think is important. So there's a communication aspect of data science. It's um, important for you to be able to know the algorithms, cleaning data, visualization, but it's also important to know how to deal with outreach and how to talk to people about what you do. How do I live? In terms of how do I finance my business, I always thought this was interesting. I personally, I am part of the SEA program. And the SEA program is instead of using unemployment, you can uh, work on your own business and still get unemployment. I have savings. I live frugally. Um, and it's been working out for me so far. That's probably not the most compelling narrative. And um, that's about it. Clients and charts, theoretical model for um, unsupervised learning. This is what you can look at in your own time. If you're interested, there's a GitHub repo on this information. And I'm ready for questions. Thank you. Yes. That is an excellent question. Here it is. It's P Cafe, Know Thy Neighbor. Yes. I still feel like we didn't uh, as an um, audience answer the apples and oranges question for everyone somehow. Um, whether, we, <laughs> whether it was an orange or an apple. <laughs> right. It was an orange. Based on this model, okay. it was an orange. Yeah, I worked at a company called Trapit. And Trapit um, takes content. It basically um, makes recommendations of content to people. For instance, let's say that you like reading about, I don't know, sports, basketball. It will, if you read lots of articles about basketball, it will give you recommendations of, OK, you like this team. Here, I think you like this article. I um, worked on the Mandarin side of it. We worked with Scikit-Learn, and for the most part, our product was in English, it was in German, it was in French, but we never tried Scikit-Learn, and we never tried our um, algorithm on Mandarin or Japanese. 
So that's um, what I, that's part of my training. Education, Education um, biological anthropology. So I worked with teeth. I looked at um, the elemental content of enamel and dentin. That's a story for another day. <laughs> At this point, I use a lot of pandas. Pandas, um, Postgres, raw SQL statements. I'm hoping to get into NoSQL databases soon. So you showed a chart on exploring machine learning, but I don't see that in the slides on GitHub. So what was that chart? Like a couple of days. Oh, you really this one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Um, talk to me after the present. This one? Give me. Yeah. Talk to me after the presentation. I added that five minutes before I did the presentation. So, yes. Um, you mentioned that you do uh, help with pricing models for, for companies in your work. Yes. I'm wondering what uh, other, other mathematics uh, is brought into play with uh, pricing models. Um, in addition to our media business units or if uh, there are other. Uh, well, we're using um, a simple linear regression at this point, calculus. So mostly calculus for this particular situation. What are the Excuse me. Oh, continue your question. I'm going to get back to your question, actually. <laughs> um, yes? Uh, what are the frontier recommendations you I know when Netflix came out with their content several years ago, I thought about entering it. And I remember towards the end, they were just looking at tiny, tiny increments. So just what are people working on? Are they just working on tiny improvements, or are there some you know, big breakthroughs that people are trying to achieve? Um, it really depends on what the problem is. The problems are very diverse to finding um, a way to predict if someone's going to get into a car accident, or um, finding a way to pick projects if you're a non-for-profit, a real contest that's going on now. Um, it really depends on what the problem is. And you should really look at the forums. The forums are great in terms of figuring out what people are doing, what algorithms they are using. Getting back to your question, if you're interested, I am doing a bit of this now. If you're interested in looking at how these algorithms work in financial data sets, I look at IPython, um, Pandas, and finance, um, excuse me, I am using a lot of ums today. <laughs> Future, like future, um, gosh, I'm sorry. Come to me later, and I will show you the IPython notebooks that I'm using. As of two, later on this year, there's actually going to be a book on pandas and financial modeling, which I'm looking forward to. But there are definitely presentations on Pi Data that I follow and just go through the notebook to learn more. <laughs> but talk to me afterwards, yeah. Kaggle has forms, and it's really good about showing you where to start. If you have, if you're working on a particular problem, it shows you other people's solutions. Sometimes people cheat and tell you exactly what they've done, what they're not supposed to. So Kaggle's very, um, it's a good resource, and I can I can show you and walk you through that um, after the presentation as well. So the, the user group in Portland, you mentioned before. Yes. A Portland data science group. Um, yes, Meetup. Let's go to Meetup and you can find it. A good group of people. And we have our hack day on Sunday as well, which is always a lot of fun. <laughs> What's the name of that book on Pandas and Pandas Do you know? I would have to look it up. It's not published yet. I think it's going to be published in November. Unless you want the pre published version, which I think is out. Yeah. But we'll, we'll talk about it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's a great question. Um, pandas is where I do my data munging. So pandas is the point where I'm given a data dump. I take my data. I query out the information that I need. I make preliminary charts. I do an EDA. And um, that's where the process starts. 
afterwards, that's when I would use scikit-learn. And all this can be done in the IPython environment. For data analysis, yes. So is that mostly the 70% data cleaning up you're talking about? Yeah, if I'm lucky. Sometimes I do have to go in and do some raw SQL. Yeah. But um, yeah, Pandas is great. Um, the alternative to Pandas would be Julia. I've never dealt with Julia or R, R Studio. So Pandas is basically Python's answer to R. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah, I love that book. And the documentation is pretty good as well. And there's also RabbitFinder, which is a visual analysis tool. So, so basically, all, all of the stuff that you need to do to put the blocks that you just connect together. Hmm. Yeah. I've never heard of rabbit. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it's uh, data mining. Data mining for the math is in the book. Oh, excellent. Well, I like Python um, for data mining. I like looking at other tools. The reason why I choose Python, R is mostly used in academia and in financial, like um, in financial markets as well. They tend to use R. But I like Python because not only can I put in the data, do my analysis, run my classifiers, but I can also use Django and Flask to actually make products. Right. right. But that being said, if you are using if you are using R, you can use a package shiny. And Shiny is R's answer to making um, an application that you can put in production. If you're putting an application in production, after you've trained a model, how do you persist it? That is a great question. Um, I'm still trying to find a good way of dealing with that problem. And I've actually been asking people at this conference the same question. <laughs> All right. Well, that's it. Thank you. Yeah.